me in particular? Why do they bother calling me? Why do they bother spamming me? Why do they bother driving me crazy with all of this stuff? And the reason is uh, security technology changes very, very fast, but people don't. Um, down at ESET, we see there are literally hundreds, I think it's there's at least 100,000 viruses, uh, new viruses every day. And they're not dramatically different, but they're new. So there is a crazy amount of new attacks coming out every day. We are constantly pushing out updates, constantly evolving our tools. But, so that makes attacking through the technology very difficult. But the same scams that involve interacting with people, those haven't changed all that much. A lot of the ways that you trick somebody into giving up information, a lot of the ways that you scare somebody into uh, handing over money that they shouldn't, those techniques haven't changed very much. Um, so once you learn how to spot them, you are absolutely very well protected. So we're going to talk about some of those as we go through here. So today's objectives and what's in it for you. Uh, understand cybercrime. So the first leg of this is going to be a, um, a high-level look at, um, oops, sorry, a high-level look at how the online crime ecosystem works. And that is going to be, we're going to talk about how they get from big name hacks and attacks and things like that through to uh, looking at the dark market. So we're going to go on a little dark market adventure. That'll be fun. And then to the end step where they're actually, you know, uh, harassing small businesses where they're coming after you guys. And that will transition into learning how to prevent it. We're going to talk about what you should be doing ahead of time to uh, protect yourself. We're going to be talking about what you should do with suspicious emails, suspicious phone calls, um, other things like that. And ultimately, our goal here today is to help you stay safe online by being a bad target. So uh, first, we're going to take a look at the structure of online crime, like I was just saying, the dark web and targets. And then we're going to move into the prevention. We're going to talk uh, specific signs of social engineering. We're going to talk phishing attacks, now to spot them. And we're going to talk defense strategies you guys can implement. So right out the gate, um, the question is why? Why attack people and organizations? What is the point of all this effort of sending spam email and getting into businesses and launching phishing attacks? Why do they do it? Well, the big reason they do it is to the surprise of no one uh, money. But let's play a little game of um, prices right here real quick. You guys can use the question box. Or you can use the chat. Um, how much money in a year? do you think all the bad guys get away with? All of the cybercrime put together in one year, about how much money do they get away with? So it's global. So let's let a few people guess. So I hear millions. If I do a number, let's, let's see how close people can get if we throw out some numbers. Uh, Rin is our highest better, 450 million, 2 million, we're getting some high guesses here. The correct answer is, I don't think anybody got it yet. Our correct answer is 600 billion. So every year, a total of $600 billion in ill-gotten gains. Um, that is crazy, 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 crazy high. And I love doing the, the guessing because I don't think anybody's ever even gotten close to 600 billion in every single time I've given this presentation because that's a lot of money. Um, so like we were saying, attackers want easy money. Attackers want easy money, and they will also want information that is worth money to somebody else. So what we're going to do through is we're going to talk about uh, the life cycle of stolen data, and we're going to look at the online ecosystem to understand how they get from, from stuff that's in the news to stuff that affects you directly. So first, let's take a look at um, what the online crime, um, what the whole ecosystem works like. So one thing that's really important to understand is uh, there usually isn't one bad guy who's involved all the way through the process. So the guy, you know, the people who are calling you on the phone who are running some scam or the people who are sending phishing emails or the people who are sending out viruses, they're not necessarily the people who came up with this plan. Um, they could be just one little leg of a much larger machine. And one of the reasons they do it this way is this kind of enables everybody to play a little bit of a part, get their money, and then bail out. 
So first, we're going to take a look at um, bottom level participants. So these are people who might even actually not know that they're part of a scam. Um, so this would include, uh, for example, mules who ship ill-gotten goods. Uh, one thing that will happen is there are small business opportunities, big quotation fingers out there, where people will um, set up a small business and they'll say, hey, can you, I'm going to mail you stuff. All you have to do is just uh, package it and mail it out of the country. And um, what's happening is those items that are getting shipped to a person were purchased with stolen credit cards or something like that. So that way they get items with stolen credit cards, they ship them out of the country, and then they can sell those. And that way the attacker has money. And the person who is shipping it out of the country, they get a little bit of money for that. And they have no idea these were ill-gotten goods. They don't even think about it. Another very, very common scam is uh, people who trade cash for fraudulent gift cards. And they may not even know that they're part of the system either. So very similar to the, to the goods project, um, what will happen here is people use illegally gotten credit cards or they'll trick somebody into uh, sending them a gift card. And what they'll do is then they'll be like, okay, I fraudulently got this $200 to Walmart gift card. Does somebody want to trade this for a little bit less cash? And it's a real gift card. It really works. There's no way to like pick it up and tell that it's it was obtained fraudulently. So people will do the trade and that's how you use gift cards to essentially launder money. And then um, let's start to move up a little bit here. So then you have the mid-level participants. Uh, these are people who like to turn attack tools into easy to use sellable products. So the people who deploy viruses and things like that, they don't have to actually invent viruses. Like there are full on ready to go kits, like how you'd go and buy Microsoft Office or something like that. And um, to help provide some of that computer horsepower, there are hack as a service, there are shady hosting providers, there are people who out there are willing to do somebody else's dirty work. And then at the very, very top level, we have um, the researchers, experts, and developers who come up with this stuff. Um, a lot of these guys aren't necessarily bad guys. A lot of these guys may be publishing research and say, hey, I figured out how to compromise a computer system. Here's how you do that. Um, or very often somebody will say, hey, I figured out how to build a virus. I'm not going to deploy it. But, you know, if somebody wants to code, somebody wants to buy the code off of me and then it's yours and then whatever you do with it, you know, that's your business. I'll wash my hands of the whole thing. So the goal of all of this is that this way uh, all of these people never get their hands completely dirty. They're involved in a little bit. They get their money and they bounce. So let's talk a little bit more about the actual uh, life cycle of data. So I mentioned this a couple of times now. How do we get from big name, big name hacks to the part where they're actually annoying me, the part where they're hitting me up on the phone? So all of these names that should be popping up right now um, are companies that, or companies or organizations that experienced uh, major attacks just within the past. Um, actually, this presentation is a little old now, so I'm sure there's a bunch more since then, but almost a 100% chance you've done business with some of these. So all of these um, suffered major data breaches just within the past few years. If I remember correctly, oops, excuse me. If I remember correctly, the Target and Equifax ones were extra famous. Um, so what ends up happening these is these are often the start of um, attacks. So what happens is somebody hacks into these guys, they get big lists of usernames and passwords, they get big lists of credit cards, they get big just bulk packages of people's personal information. And that's where a lot of these attacks start. So now the question becomes, and let me actually rewind that so I don't spoil the answer. Uh, now the question becomes, you know, you've got a list of a million phone numbers to try and scam because you hack target. Where does that data go? Where do all of these, all that private information that's been stolen go? And it goes to the, uh, the dark web, it goes to dark markets. Um, so what happens is somebody has this, they want to unload it, they want to share it, they want to say, okay, I did the hack, I got the stuff off target, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Uh, they take it to the dark web. And for those of you who haven't seen, we have some fun screenshots of uh, dark web websites. These websites are remarkably, remarkably sophisticated. They are like the Amazon of ill-gotten goods. It's almost like, I have you ever seen a cartoon or something where they depict the black market? And it's literally a black market and it's like, oh, we have 
you know, depicted if it was an actual store. I think Family Guy did it at one point. Anyway, that's what this is. It is incredibly organized. So let me go ahead and blow the screen shut up. Uh, a lot of fun things to look at here. This is real, by the way. Uh, first off, if you go down the left column, look at all of these lovely categories of things you can get. Um, so right at the gate, drugs is the biggest category. We love that. Uh, counterfeits, jewelry. So carding wear, I had to look up what that one is. Carding wear is referring to um, card skimmers. Have you ever heard about somebody says uh, they attach a device to the ATM or to the gas pump to grab credit cards when it goes by? That's what carding wear is. Um, and then, of course, we have a huge, 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 huge section here for uh, software and malware. So stolen data ends up here. Tools to do illegal things end up here. And one thing I also want you guys to look at as we go down this list, this stuff is dirt, dirt cheap. Uh, you want the ultimate Bitcoin stealing guide? 10 bucks. Uh, let's see, you want a, uh, a tool to hijack Android devices? That's two euros. It only has three stars though. So that's the other thing that's even hilarious, even more hilarious is you notice people are leaving reviews on here. So it's like, oh my God, this attack worked great. I could steal so much money with it. Five stars. It's almost comical how incredibly, incredibly sophisticated it is. And um, to do all of this, they use Bitcoin. And I'm going to not do the full explanation of Bitcoin because that's probably enough to fill up a completely different slide deck. But the advantage to Bitcoin is that unlike most online money systems which verify the identity, Bitcoin doesn't verify the people, it verifies the money. So every Bitcoin is unique. And this means that you can exchange and track uh, Bitcoins, but the people exchanging the Bitcoins can be total John, Don, excuse me, be total John Doe. So you have no idea who is exchanging money unless they choose to reveal it. But you know that the money's good. So sort of like cash, if you, you get a dollar bill somehow, it's a real dollar bill. It doesn't matter its history before. Um, so what can you buy? We saw a little bit of things. Uh, you can buy stolen data, just like we've been talking about. So data stolen from Target, Equifax, places like that, it ends up here. And that includes credit cards, that includes logins, like usernames and passwords, that includes people's personal information. Uh, you can also buy malware. So for those who aren't familiar, that's our that's the catch-all term for viruses, trojans, da 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 da, da everything down. We literally just badware. Um, you can buy those as pre-made, ready-to-go packages that you can customize if you'd like. Uh, you can even do things like hire a DDoS attack, which is a um, the short explanation is a DDoS attack is when you send so much traffic to one site or one business that it gets overwhelmed and shut down. Uh, you can even hire a botnet, which gives you just, a botnet is literally a thousands or hundreds of thousands of computers that just accept instructions. So you could use that to, you could have your botnet set in spam and things like that. So if I'm a smart shopper, I actually don't have to know a lot about computers at all to pull off a pretty sophisticated attack here. I can go on the dark web and I can get some stolen data. So now I have a huge list of emails to try and attack. I can get a lovely pre-made virus and I can you know, use that to uh, use that in the emails that I'm gonna send that I just got. Um, and then I can get a botnet and the botnet can actually do the dirty work of actually sending all those emails to the people that, that are of the stolen data list containing the malware I just bought. And there are lovely step-by-step -step guides for all of this. So it's actually super duper easy. And this is where we finally get to the step where um, the attacks start affecting you. So they got the data, they got the people to attack with it, they got the packages and payloads, they've got their scam already. Uh, then they start going after people. So using the chat or the question boxes, um, what kind of people do you think that attackers like to go after? Like what kind of person? And I mean, you guys can throw pretty much any guess out. So a lot of people right out the gate guessed, uh, guessed my first bullet point um, correct because yep, senior citizens. Senior citizens are a very popular target. Um, part of the reason that they're a big target is um, technical experience, uh, lack of technical experience. Uh, also very tragically, a lot of seniors will have a nest egg or something that they're trying to, that they're trying to go after. So seniors are very often a target. 
Um, one that you may not, oh, and I saw that somebody said anyone in all caps. You are completely correct. Nobody's exempt. Um, on the other hand, though, they do go after young adults as well. There are a lot of scams that target young adults. And you would think, oh, but I thought young people were good with computers. Well, here's the thing. The, the part about if you scare somebody, they make bad decisions, that's still true for young people. Also, a lot of young people don't have a lot of options. So a lot of young people may be more uh, prone to take something that's a shady deal. Uh, for example, one very, very common scam we see, um, it happens on Craigslist or it happens just as an email scam, is they, um, they, send, an, they send a message that says, excuse me, sorry about that. Um, they send an email that says, um, hey, there's this lovely property uh, you know, in North Park, great area for young people. Are you interested? Rent is dirt cheap, but it's only going to be on the property. It's only going to be on the market for the next like 24 hours. So I'll tell you what, you uh, you send over the first month's rent, and then tomorrow I'll give you a call, and you can come down and check out the place. But here's all the pictures. It looks lovely. This is a great opportunity. You should take it. And some people send the money, and of course it's a total fib. There was no there's was no apartment that was up for grabs. There was everything was a complete complete fib. So that's the sort of scams that come after young people, and we do see that. Uh, business owners also do get targeted, especially small business owners. Um, I noticed some of you guys said people with money, which is true. So that's why they like to go after business owners. Businesses do, of course, tend to have more cash sitting around that to be scammed out of. Uh, small businesses are also very often a target. And one of the reasons that small businesses get targeted um, is that, um, if you're somebody who runs a small business, you probably have to wear a lot of hats. So you may be the guy who runs the company, but you're also the guy who plays accountant and you're the guy who sets up the IT and all the computers. And there's only so many hours, hours in a day. So it's very, very likely that your IT security setup is gonna be a little bit behind the times. And that means that if you're somebody who has a lot of money and maybe not the greatest IT setup, you're a potential target. So with that, we are going to transition into uh, types of attacks. And the first one we're gonna look at is uh, social engineering. And you're gonna see elements of social engineering in pretty much everything that we talk about. Uh, so the fancy Wikipedia definition is, social engineering is the manipulation of people into disclosing confidential or sensitive information. Really, really, it's a fancy term for tricking people. Uh, social engineering comes in a lot of formats. Uh, there are, of course, phishing attacks, which are email scams. We're going to do a whole big leg on that in just a second. Uh, vishing attacks, a.k.a. phone scams, which we do get a lot of these days. Um, we also get, uh, they can come via anything. We can even have attacks via chat and um, attacks even in person. So one definition of an attack that can happen um, in person that we will see and does happen is somebody goes and buys a jumpsuit, somebody gets a little um, uh, a logo ironed on here for the cable company or for the gas and electric company, they carry a toolbox, and they get to walk into pretty much anywhere. They go up to a business and they say, hey, I'm here to you know check out whatever, and they look official, and people let them mosey right in. So that's in-person social engineering. They act like they're supposed to be there, and they look like they're supposed to be there. Uh, so some social engineering signs. So how do you know if somebody is trying to uh, take advantage of me? What are the signs that I am getting um, uh, taken advantage of or that somebody might be trying to take advantage of me? Uh, first one out the gate is uh, unsolicited contact. So by this, um, what I mean is um, they've reached out to you first. Um, you know, generally, you know, sometimes if somebody's reaching out to you first via a phone call or via um, email or something like that, that may just be they're trying to sell something. So in and of itself, it doesn't, you know, in and of itself, it doesn't mean a lot, but it is one red flag of just a few. So if they reached out to you first, they want something. Another one is they don't know you. Now, sometimes attackers will manage to get your information correct because it was part of a data breach or something like that or your information is just publicly out there. Um, 
But very, very often when you get a phishing email or something like that, they don't know who you are and it shows. So as an example that we're gonna see if you get an email from a company you do business with, such as, I don't know, Netflix. Netflix should know your name. When Netflix sends you an email, it should say who you are. And if it says dear customer or just something, that's a sign right there. Another very, very, very common sign is typos and grammar. So a lot of people who are conducting scams aren't doing it in their native language. And the reason they're not, they're not doing it in their native language is a lot of these attacks are international because there just isn't the international um, law enforcement cooperation to catch people. So if you're targeting people on another continent, you're probably gonna get away with it. But this means that you're not working in your native tongue and very, very often this is gonna show. Meanwhile, uh, when, company, when real companies try to contact you, they work very, very hard to make sure that their emails are polished and professional. So a huge sign that something is up is when a real company has a shoddy or email with typos, with grammar mistakes. If things just don't, don't seem up to snuff, that's a big sign. Uh, another very, very common one is a false sense of urgency. And this can go either a scary way or an exciting way. Um, but, but basically it means that they're trying, to, they're trying to convince you to do something now before you have a chance to think about it. And um, so we used the example earlier when we talked about the apartment, that scam, that scam, it's like, hey, this place is only gonna be on the market for 24 hours. It's a great opportunity if you want it, act now. And it was a lie, but people are gonna take it. And we will see a lot of other scams are like, hey, you broke the law, you have to pay up within 72 hours or you're going to jail. And again, that's a fib, but a lot of people who don't stop and think are gonna get scared and cough up the money. Another very, very, very common sign is unusual payment methods. Uh, so by unusual payment methods, I mean Bitcoin, I mean mailing cash, I mean uh, purchasing, uh, not credit cards, purchasing gift cards, um, things like that. Legitimate businesses really, really, really like credit cards and debit cards because they make a paper trail. And that paper trail can, can help track down uh, who both people are, in, you know, with credit cards and debit cards and things like that, you can reverse a payment if something has really gone wrong. Whereas if you put money in an envelope, if you send Bitcoin, if you buy gift cards and mail it, that money is gone. It is gone, gone with no ability to recover it, which is great for people who are trying to do something evil and not so good for you. So unusual payment methods are a huge sign. Uh, so some of the, so we just talked about a ton of tips. Uh, so what we want to do is be very, very careful disclosing any info to somebody who you're talking to, who you don't know who they are. Always verify that they say who they say they are. Um, if it's a business calling you that you've worked with before, they should know about you. They should know who you are. They should know things about you. Um, if they don't seem to know anything about you or they're getting it out of you, that's a bad sign. And when in doubt, say no. When in doubt, Absolutely say no. If it's a legitimate business, they'll, they'll get you on the next phone call. So to step forward, um, let's specifically talk phishing because phishing is probably the most common way, uh, one of the most common ways that malware spreads and one of the most common ways that uh, people get scammed because you can send out so many emails very quickly. So the idea behind phishing is similar to other social engineering, but what is great about phishing is you can send out 10,000 emails or even more and you can do it automatically and you can do it you know, while you're just letting your system run automatically spamming people. And of all of those millions of phishing emails, only a few have to actually be successful for you to make money. So it's really an exercise that's worth it. And very, very often these phishing emails, um, they have to try and trick you right out the gate. So let's take a look at an example one. So this is one that actually came to uh, my coworker, Dennis. Um, it is real. And the one thing that I do wanna point out here is um, this is a phishing email, but they actually got a bunch of information correct. So first off, it says, hi, Dennis, that really is him. And then the other thing I wanna point out, it says Brent McCarty, that really is ESET CEO. So they are two for two on correct information. Uh, they, which phishing emails are not always, but this one did get it. So right at the gate here, it says, 
hi Dennis, I'm in a conference meeting, can't talk on the phone, send me your personal number, I need you to get something done for me. Thanks, Brent. Immediately very suspicious, and if you are somebody who's new to the company, or you especially you work for a large organization where you know you don't know your CEO, they're just a portrait on the wall, this might work. This might work, because once you send that personal number, all of the communication is outside of the company. Um, another one that this, this also came to another employee is uh, this, thank you for subscribing to our adult dating list. So this is where they're clever. This is a complete fib. There is no adult dating list. But what they really, really, really want you to do is click this unsubscribe button. And we'll talk about this a little bit more, but do not click buttons in suspicious emails ever. Don't click buttons, don't follow links, just don't. Because what they want you to do and the purpose of this email is to check if there really is a live person at that email. Because if you click that button, you won't get unsubscribed, it's a lie you will tell them that, hey, there's a real person at this email address, they're clicking links, they're reading emails, they're following instructions, they're a good target for getting scammed. So in all circumstances, you wanna leave those alone. Um, another very, very common example, another very, very common method is to uh, tell a half truth and then embellish it from there. So um, the top part of this, this uh, phishing message that's a fib, so that's that's a lie. So he claims, oh, I hacked your operating system, I got full access to your account, you know, very scary words. This bottom part, this bottom part is true, or was true for this employee. I mean, we changed it so he didn't put his whole password on the TV, but you got it. Anyway, what happened in this situation is uh, this person had their, you know, they used their information to say target, Target had a data breach, their username and password got out there, and then the person who sent this phishing attack put that information that was now out there in the email, so that way they can put a little bit of truth inside of a big lie, and that can be very, very convincing for a lot of people. So just because they managed to find out some of your personal information doesn't mean that the whole horror story is true, and they are relying on the fact that you're gonna see that, you're gonna go, oh my God, that is my password, they must be telling the truth, and do something you shouldn't. So we've already started to talk about this, but let's look at some, some a specific examples. How do you spot a phishing email? Uh, so, so I can get one up here. Uh, I've used Netflix already as a couple examples here. Um, I'm gonna talk through this one as we're going, but if you guys wanna shout out in the chat anything that's immediately suspicious out the gate here, um, you're welcome to do it. So first off, out the gate, we talked about buttons. There's a suspicious one there. And uh, one thing that I want to point out is uh, wrong logo. Yes, somebody noticed that's not Netflix's logo. It's close, but no cigar. Um, so Naomi pointed out there's no lock. Um, we actually recommend not using, um, not use, so emails, emails are inherently unsecure. Um, usually within an organization and things like that, it's pretty trustworthy. But emails in general aren't a secure communication um, aren't a, a uh, secure communication format. So if you see an email and it's plastered with locks and it's like, oh my god, this is so secure, take take that with a grain of salt, especially if it's asking for personal information via email. Uh, when you're on the web, when you're using your web browser, then um, the lock icon is important. So that's an important distinction. Lock icon on email maybe fishy. Lock icon in the web browser that's good. Yep, so somebody pointed out right out the gate, dear customer, they don't know who you are. Netflix should. And like a lot of people already pointed out, that email address is suspicious. Um, and this one, clearly they stole somebody else's domain to send names because obviously luxury tours Mexico, that's not even close. Sometimes they get really clever with those. We've, we've seen ones where it's like N-E-T-F-I-I-X. So it's like Netflix. And they're hoping that you that you aren't reading very close. And yeah, they also managed to, to spell uh, reply wrong. They spelled it no replay. That's another mistake. And we've pointed out buttons. One tip that I wanna give you guys is um, you don't do not click buttons. I definitely remember, oh, do, is there a grandma? We thank your, oh my God, I never even noticed that one. Uh, good catch, uh, Sally. I didn't even notice that one. I've seen that one up a zillion times. So. Anyway, what I wanted to point out here is um, 
in emails, if you're on your desktop computer, you can hold your mouse over a button and it'll tell you where it's going. And if where it's going looks suspicious or weird, that's another red flag right there. So on top of the typos and on top of the from address being wrong and on top of the bad logo, this is bad, 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 bad news. Um, content reasonability. So this is another one. This is a great check um, just to kind of catch yourself if nothing else is sticking out. Uh, are they asking for something sane? So first off, once again, they don't know your name. But also, let's take a look at this paragraph here. To continue using Netflix, you need to update or verify your billing information. Please note that failure to complete the verification process will result in permanent suspension of your Netflix membership. Also, I'm, I know I just told you guys to watch for, watch for typos. Membership isn't spelled right. It's, it's like membership. That's not correct. Anyway, what I want to point out is this is not a sane or reasonable thing for Netflix to, for Netflix to ask, for Netflix to do. Why would Netflix want to permanently suspend you and kick you off the service over a billing error? Like they would rather you fix that and keep giving them money once a month. So that's immediately unreasonable. And we do see variants like this um, in things like, uh, it's like somebody will, like things that are masquerading, like they're from the police or something like that. They'll say, hey, you have to pay up now or you're going to jail. And it's like, I think the law is a little bit more complicated than you have to pay up now or you're going to jail in 72 hours. So especially if it's an extreme threat, this is not sane. So now the, now the follow-up questions becomes, what do I do when I'm not sure? What do I do when there's a couple of red flags, but I'm not super duper sure? Uh, first thing that you want to do is you want to get family and friends' opinion. Get somebody else's eyeballs on it. Don't look alone. And as somebody who has been both professional tech support and family tech support, I would much, 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 much rather answer the question of, hey, is this email legit? Then uh, I answered an email that I shouldn't have, and now everything's all screwed up. So by all means, get somebody's eyeballs on it. Don't feel bad about asking. Uh, don't forward the email, though. It's a bad idea to um, forward um, uh, bad idea to forward emails. Uh, I noticed somebody already mentioned that they Googled uh, information in the phone number. Uh, Googling the text of the message is also a very, very good way to see if it's a scam. Um, so by that, I mean um, you take the entire message and you copy paste the whole thing into Google. Now remember, phishing emails are very, very often sent to a large number of people, which, and they're almost the exact same. So when these emails get sent to a large number of people, um, that means that people are going to talk about it online. That means that it's going to be out there in general. But if it's a unique message, it shouldn't show up on Google. So if you see conversation about it on Google, that means it's probably fake. If it doesn't show up, that means it was uniquely crafted for you. And I saw somebody said, oh, Aaron said it, go to your accounts, accounts directly. Yep. Contact the supposed sender another way. So exactly what Aaron just said. Um, if there's a problem with your Netflix account, pick up the phone and call Netflix. Uh, there's a problem with your, your banking service, log into your bank through their website. Uh, if you, there's claimed, if say for example, you get a threatening letter from the IRS, which is a very common scam, don't reply to that email, contact the IRS through the information on their website. Don't trust anything in that email, including uh, contact methods. And as always, uh, don't reply at all if you're unsure. Um, this includes uh, this includes um, replying to chew them out. One thing that, that has happened when I've given this presentation is a lot of people love to say that they like to reply to some spam emails and share some very colorful language um, with the spammer. And I'll be honest, I get it, I do. But all you're doing is telling them that there's a real person who checks this email and replies to stuff and reads stuff. The best thing you can do to make them go away is give them total, total silence. No replies, no responses, no nothing. So like we said, fishing chip summary, uh, check the URLs, uh, read through the content, read through the message, um, check for presence of name and personal information, check for grammar, uh, look for, tr for tone, like we were saying, if it's got that threatening or that sense of urgency, uh, do research on it. Just don't immediately assume it's true and respond to it. And like we said, do not click. 
So most attacks rely on a, whoops, jumped ahead. Most attacks rely on, fear is a very, very common element in attacks as we've seen a bunch here. But fortunately for us, uh, criminals are lazy. Um, their goal is to scam a lot of people, but they don't want to put a lot of effort into it. And that means that any extra effort to attack somebody usually doesn't happen. So they much prefer low hanging fruit. They prefer people who respond to emails. They prefer people who leave their passwords set to password. Um, practicing good habits is going to make you immune to the vast majority of attacks. Um, so one thing that I do want to stress that can be an exception there when I say uh, attackers don't want to put in effort, uh, they will put in a little bit more if you are um, a target of a special interest like we were talking about, like they will put more effort into somebody who runs a small business. They will put um, more effort into uh, people who seem to be fairly high up the ladder at an organization. Um, one, I'm trying to remember this happened a few years ago. One phishing email um, came to one of ESIT's exec members a few years ago and it said, hey, Brandon, correct name, this is for your flight. This is information about your Delta Airlines flight to Chicago on June 27th. And that was correct. The reason that they sent that spam email is he was scheduled to do a conference and that was public information. So somebody looked at it and they went, I'm going to try and scam people by trying to tell them about their, about their plane ticket to Chicago on this date. And let's see if somebody re replies to it. And they got all the information correct, except what airline he's on. And he knew what to spot it because he works for our company. But if you are somebody who is high up in an organization, they can get remarkably sophisticated and do their homework. So do keep an eye out for that if you're somebody who's up the rungs a little bit. So that was, that was high level defense strategy. Let's talk about the rest of us uh, for general purpose defense strategy. Um, Update regularly if you're, this is especially important if you're at work for a business, this is a little, um, oh, I'm sorry, Leticia, we're, we're right near the end and this is gonna be recorded, so we'll make that available to you guys. Uh, defense strategy, um, update regularly. If your system is prompting to update, do it. Uh, backup your data. I cannot stress enough how important having a backup of your data is. If people encrypt your data, if people steal it, if somebody gets onto your system, having a backup of your data can absolutely save heartbreak. Um, if you're, so if you work for a business, if, so not having data backup for a business can totally kill the business, but even for um, individuals, just losing things like your tax data or your photos of your family, that can be a tragedy too. So please make a point to back up. Um, there are lots of online services, I believe Google and Apple at this point, I know for sure Google will give you some storage for free. Um, we don't, um, ESET doesn't offer one, but there's, uh, for consumers, but there is a uh, lot out there. I strongly encourage everybody to do it. Uh, security software. Um, I'm not going to use this opportunity to plug ours in particular, but you do want to have general purpose security software that includes antivirus that includes firewall and things like that. Um, pretty much any of the general purpose antivirus and firewall Swiss army knife tools out there are gonna do the job, but you should have one, you really should. And training, so good news, you've already sat through a bunch of it. Um, but there are some offline resources that I'm gonna link you guys near the end of this one for more information as well. And above all else, being vigilant, remembering the tips that you've learned here, and making sure you know your resources to get help. Um, and I'm gonna share some resources with you guys in just a second. Let's see. Let me call them all up at once here, just in case people want to take a screenshot. All right, so a few resources here. Um, ESET has their own online cyber training course. Uh, we offer both a freebie version and a premium version. Um, both of these uh, contain videos on, on security information. Um, they contain interactive games and things like that. I developed a bunch of them, so if you think that I'm interesting and know what I'm talking about, then this is a great place to go for more of that. Uh, the FTC has a lot of information on their on their site as well. Um, if you think you've been a victim of uh, identity theft, um, the ID Theft Center is a great resource. Um, Stay Safe Online as well is also a um, good resource for general purpose tips. And that brings me to the end of our slide deck. And I'm not going to advance it to the thank you slide. I'm going to leave that up on there just in case people want to write it down. 
But I believe we do have a few minutes um, for Q&A. If anybody wants to um, ask any questions, I can see in the question box. Uh, stuff can also get emailed over later, but uh, thank you very much, you guys. Not able to see material being shared. Hmm. Oh, thank you. Everybody has nice things to say. Cool. Let's see. I'm looking to see if anybody posts an actual question. Thank you for the compliments, though. And yes, I am sorry about the cat that went uh, careening through the background of my shot at multiple points. <laughs> and yeah, so I know I think Armando is going to have more information for you about um, the recording of this and making things available like that. Um, so making you use safe passwords on your iPhone, um, your business is going to be more in charge with that. So um, if you're required to use a very secure password on your iPhone, that's probably something your business is doing. Um, if, you've, if you've unsubscribed emails, um, stop clicking the unsubscribe button. Um, there's really no way to undo it, but the best thing to do is to just go silent. Uh, spam calls are a perennial problem. Um, a lot of that lies with the phone company right now, and we don't have a good solution for it. Um, yeah, I can post these resources in the chat. Let me um, copy paste some of this stuff. Oops, uh, where's my questions box? There it goes. All right, let me copy paste some of that information so people can get to it more easily. All right, so I'm going to put this one in the. Uh, oops. There we go. So I just put that in the uh, the chat. That question about um, uh, downloading copies of those resources. Let's see. Uh, I believe someone posed as an ESET technician. Um, yes. Yeah, so very very often people will pose as uh, cyber as technicians from lots and lots of companies. Um, the best thing to do is to hang up and do not provide information. Uh, robocalls should get blocked. Um, let's see. Let's see. We had a question here about. Uh, 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 Karen, can you explain a little bit more about uh, the password question? Uh, to Adrian's question, I certainly think so. I think there's just a lot going on in the world. now. It's very, very hard to catch online criminals, which is why it's um, such a popular thing to do. It is uh, very, very, very... Uh, um, it is very, very hard to get caught, especially when you're doing things internationally, like I said before, because it's like... You know, the, even even if it's a, a government that's motivated to catch people, if they're outside of that jurisdiction, it's very hard. Um, oh, I closed the slide. Um, I can go ahead and pop that back open for people. I just needed to copy paste uh, from current slide. All right, so I think that popped that slide back up for people. Um, so for, for websites that save your passwords for you, there are tools called password managers um, ESET doesn't make one. There are usually uh, tools that are apps and things like that. Um, we do, um, we do, we do actually recommend using them. We do recommend using a trustworthy one if you're going to use a password manager. Um, some of the top-rated uh, apps for password management on the um, uh, Android marketplace and the iPhone app marketplace; those are usually pretty good. Um, I can't recommend a specific one, but there are tools that will help store and manage passwords for you. Um, and having, having passwords stored and managed is actually better security than just using the same password for everything. Uh, Life, LifeLock, I'm not too familiar with. Um, I believe LifeLock is a, um, it's not really, even though Norton owns it, uh, LifeLock really isn't a computer security product. It's just them watching your account. So it's a little outside of a cybersecurity bubble. So I'm not as familiar with it. I have heard LastPass is really, really good. Um, I don't want to recommend anybody together, but if you're looking for a name to follow up, LastPass is, is one to start with. And yeah, just to confirm from Armando, for anybody who can't see the chat, there will be a recording of this presentation sent out once we've concluded. And um, I'm also going to throw my... Uh, wait, no. I also threw my, uh, my email address in the chat, so if people want to do any follow-ups, I am going to be available to do that. Um, 
I personally, I am a Chrome user. Um, all of those are going to be pretty comparable when it comes to security at this point. Um, the other things that I mentioned during the presentation, like good password management and keeping everything up to date, that's going to be uh, the most important. Uh, so for browser personal preference, as long as it's up to date. Let's see. Hey, Armando, um, what is our total time here? Because I noticed it's 12.52. I don't want to be uh, overlapping people's other meetings. Uh, we have until 1 o'clock, so we can continue to answer questions if you'd like. All right. Um, yeah, it looks like questions are, are slowing down, but if, if questions come to you via email or I put my, uh, my email address in the chat, I'm happy to accept them too. Um, that works as well. Um, but I believe that's it for me. Okay, great. Thank you so much for inviting me, you guys. Of course, we appreciate you joining us, and uh, this has been a lot of great information. Again, if you would like to contact Aubrey, uh, the email address is in the chat box there, and we can always uh, answer any questions that you might have in regards to CalCoast as well. Uh, you can contact Armando or Andres or myself. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and put our contact info in the box uh, right now. All right, so with that, I want to thank you again, Aubrey, for presenting today, and hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Peace out, y'all.